<laughs> so I am pleased to uh, introduce Yael Serra Teichler, Teichler? Oh. from the University of Tucha, from the Open University here, Revelation, Interpretation, and Sensation, or Reality in Moses Medicine Bible Commentary, but I see something else up here. Really? Yeah. Moses Medicine's musical Jews and go for it. Hold the, the mic closer. We've got, we got Mike first. Old man. Mike, it's Mike good here. that you didn't hear my first comment. This is this good? Yeah, Michael. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> is this good? Can you mm. hear me? No. Let him get him close. I can't see this. No, let him do it. We don't need the energy that well. No, we don't deal with my No, we can say it's kind of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a Definitely not in Talmud or our Mishnah history. And yet, um, the, the last session, um, I found in it so many, so many uh, echoes, um, whether now historically, anachronistically speaking or not, but echoes with, uh, with most Jameson's um, exegesis of the Torah and concept of language and translation. So I'll just start. Moses Mendelssohn's German translation of the Bible with Hebrew commentary, the Hebrew, a project lar largely carried out between 1770 and the mid-1780s, was not only, as David Sorkin observed, the eyes with German enlightenment. In devoting himself to biblical criticism and his synthesis of Tanakhia to Jesus and literalist medieval and early modern Jewish traditions, Mendelssohn set a model explicitly opposed to contemporary non-Jewish Bibles, however, given. Biblical translations such as those by Isaiah and Herder were marked by a Christological sense of supersessionism that attempted to make the remote and peculiar text of the Old Testament part of German cultural patrimony. At the same time, Mendelssohn's translation with commentary was, was primarily intended inwardly as an attempt to restore for the Ashkenazic Jewish world the centrality of the Hebrew Bible as a source of practical knowledge and revive its literal study next to, if not replacing, the Talmud and Kabbalah. Yet a further fundamental component that distinguishes Mendelssohn's translation and commentary has to do with the beauty of the Hebrew Bible. The origins of this aesthetic concept of language and to biblical exegesis seems to have been made a decade or two earlier in the 1750s and 60s in philosophical and critical frameworks that Mendelssohn had developed in his earliest German writings concerned with aesthetics. It was around the same time as the first German writings on aesthetics in the mid-1750s that Mendelssohn published also Kohedat Musa, the moral preacher, between 1755 and 1758. Kohedat Musa was a short-lived Hebrew periodical that introduced its learned Jewish readers to new aesthetic concepts and linked religious piety and moral sensibility with a sense with a central appreciation of the beauty of divine creation. <laughs> While then Kohelet Musa went against the brain in some respects, against the brain of Ashkenazic rabbinic Judaism's anxieties of sensual pleasure, it maintained continuity with Jewish tradition by drawing extensively on ancient rabbinic and particularly biblical texts, depicting their style and subject matter as God's aesthetic dispensation to mankind. Both the early writings on aesthetics and Kohelet Musa link aesthetic pleasure with emotions and moral sentiments, a link that reappears in a new garb in Mendelssohn's exegetic engagement with the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, and above all, its poetry. More specifically, the deployment of aesthetic concepts in the Bi'ur serves to em emphasize the musicality and more generally morality of the Torah and Hebrew biblical poetry as key exegetic notions. As I hope to demonstrate, this hermeneutical synthesis lent Mendelssohn's Be'or an appeal to enlightenment
Enlightenment sensibilities and ultimately served his political theological critique of Christian Bible scholarship. Mendelssohn's particularly extensive treatment of music in his essays on the arts reflects an aesthetic pragmatism typical of the North German Aufklärung, which located music's paramount purpose in its ability to awaken emotions, move the passions, and appeal to universal rather than specifically Christian moral sentiments. The rise of new theories that linked aesthetic pleasure with moral sentiments generated inclusive attitudes perceived in turn as a key to ethical regeneration and to social and cultural betterment. This link was inherent in the concept of Bildung, and music was hailed as a prime vehicle thereof. In what follows, they offer a contrapuntal kind of reading of Mendelssohn's discourse about music in allegedly different bodies of work, the aesthetic writings and the Beor to the, um, uh, to the Pentateuch. As my reading begins to show, Mendelssohn's notions of music and poetry, first discussed in a universal philosophical context, provide a pivotal conceptual key for understanding his later discussion about biblical law and Hebrew poetry in the Beor, and perhaps also vice versa. I suggest that his use of aesthetic concepts in the biblical commentary rendered modern philosophy a natural hermeneutical continuation of his otherwise traditionalist biblical exegesis. He thereby not only conducted a critical dialogue both with non-Jewish Bible scholarship and rabbinic Ashkenazi Judaism, the particular emphasis on music and the orality of the Torah served to assert the singularity of revealed Jewish law and to buttress a defense of Judaism as an inherently musical and hence enlightened religion, past and present, ancient and modern, placing it as an equal, perhaps even superior, factor at the heart of European enlightenment or European civilization. The earliest discussion about music <coughs> appears in Nelson's first aesthetic treatise called On the Sentiments, Ready and Finnegan, published in 1755. Here, he grants music a singular position superior to all other arts because it offers all three types of pleasure that Nelson had established as components of aesthetic experience. I read selectively. Divine art of music, you are the only one that surprises us with all three pleasures. What sweet confusion of perfection for common height, sensuous fortification, physical sensation, and beauty, and so on. And he concludes, all these delights, all these three delights, offer their hands to one another as sisters and vie for our favor and competition with one another. Are people still surprised at the magical power of harmony? Rendering music a divine art and locating its edifying potential in the coherence of all three types of pleasure, perfection, beauty, and physical sensation, I'm sure that Rambam scholars, Mamana scholars, realize that perfection is, is, I think, as far as I understand, um, the concept taken from there. But we can, I can ask you about that later. Uh, so, the edifying potential and the coherence of all three types of pleasure, perfection, beauty, and physical sensation, links music in this and subsequent texts to the aesthetic, emotional, and ethical experience associated with the sublime, the Tahabna. In the 1758 essay on the sublime and the naive in the fine sciences, Mendelssohn defines sublimity as that which is intensively enormous or strong in its perfection and its common height. And I read again, each thing that is or appears immense as far as the degree of its perfection is concerned is called sublime. God is called the most sublime being. In the fine arts and sciences, the, sens the sensuously perfect representation of something immense will be sublime, depending on its degree of perfection. The sentiment produced by the sublime, by the magnitude of perfection, that is, he calls the composite. The immensity arouses a sweet shudder that rushes through every fiber of our being, giving wings to the imagination to press further and further without stopping. All the sentiments blend together in the soul, flowing into one another, and become a single phenomenon which we call awe, the wonderful. And so we can say that the sublime is what he calls something sensuously perfect in art, capable of inspiring awe. 
The aesthetic category of the sublime was a central axis in Mendelssohn's entire philosophical project and a conceptual kernel to his critique of enlightenment. In 18th century thought, the sublime was a cardinal rhetorical and aesthetic category, initially used to capture emphatic aesthetic and emotional poetic experience, including the affect of biblical poetry. Bible scholars and poets, initially in England and subsequently in Germany, were fascinated with the power of the sublime to move a wide range of passions. By the mid 18th century, the sublime had entered also musical thought and compositional theory with the idea that to move the passions to transcendent sentiments, poetic intention was best expressed in music. That is, poetry in the, in the um, marriage between words and music. The fascination with the sublime played a role in liberating the emotional and moral function of music from the domination of Christian theology and metaphysics in the 18th century. In this sense, it was instrumental in opening up new sonic spheres that could be commonly shared by Christians and non-Christians alike on the basis of non-referential emotional and aesthetic experience. In other words, it seems that if the capacity to be moved in sympathy in, in mit, with midlife and sympathy in response to music had long been considered a manifestation of Christian moral virtue, late enlightenment notions made the boundaries of aesthetic and emotional experience more neutral and increasingly coarse. Mendelssohn did not merely respond to such ideational transformations, but also partook in engendering them and exploring their boundaries. Mendelssohn's first discussion of the sublime appears in his 1757 review of the Oxford Lectures on the Sacred Poetry of the Hebrews by Robert Loeb. The review, which was published in one of the pioneering periodicals of German literary criticism, edited by himself and Nikolai, uh, introduced a literary critical reading of biblical poetry, neither Christological nor rabbinical, that was as new to Judaism as it was to Christianity. Following Loth, Mendelssohn drew on the category of the sublime to capture Hebrew biblical poetry's plain and lucid style, its fiery language, as he calls it, and visual imagery, praising the oriental taste of the ancient Hebrew poets and the sublime emotions that their poetry awakens in us. In this and subsequent essays written between the late 1750s and the 1770s, Mendelssohn juxtaposed the sublime and the beautiful associated in turn with Greek culture, with Greek beauty, as two separate yet complementary aesthetic categories and emotional experiences. Contrasting the different rules of art, Engel der Kunst, between ancient Hebrew poetry and the poetry of Greco-Roman tradition, Mendelssohn attempted to secure for Hebrew an equal footing with the Greco-Roman origins of modern European poetry. To Mendelssohn, the ultimate purpose of art is to evoke in us sublime emotions. So if awe, bewunderung, and amazement, erstaunen, are sources of sublime emotions, then music, being revealed progressively in time, lends itself most adequately to the aesthetic, emotional, and ethical experience of sublimity. Eyesight, for example, uh, cannot awaken the same intensity, uh, the same sublime sentiments in the same way that music can. However, music alone does not suffice to express and evoke a specific sublime sentiment. It is non-referential. Music is non-referential on its own. It lacks a concrete referent in a system um, of what Mendelssohn calls uh, natural science. To be adequate for expressing concrete sentiments, religious or other, music therefore must be wedded with arbitrary, what he calls arbitrary signs with words. And I quote from the uh, 1761 essay um, on the main principles of fine, art, of, of fine arts. The expression of sentiment in music is intense, but indeterminate. One is pervaded by a certain sentiment, but it is obscure and not limited to any individual object. This lack can be remedied by the addition of distinct and arbitrary signs, words. The words can make the sentiment into an individual sentiment. Now, coupled with <coughs> poetry and painting or stage design, the result is the modern art. Mendelssohn's first discussion on the ex of the expression of sublime sentiments in words and music had appeared in his earliest discussion on the relationship between Hebrew scriptures and music back 
in the Loth Review of 1757. For Mendelssohn, as for Loth, the supreme and most ancient human representation of the sublime are the Psalms of David, proof of the musical and poetic primacy of Judaism. And I quote from the Loth Review, the Hebrews alone offer the earliest examples of poetic hymns in praise of God. Already before the kings, the prophets were taught the art of song and poetry. Under the reign of King David, the art of music and poetry reached its highest degree. 4,000 singers and musicians alternatingly sang hymns in the temple. It was there that most of the songs were created, which have survived to the present day. The adequate response to the divine is then a human representation of divine perfection in music and words. These discrete descriptions of the power of the marriage between words and music on both the mind and the sentiments refer to different experiences. In the arts, in opera, for example, as he, uh, the example which he gives in one place, and in religious practice. The triangular relationship between words, music, and meaning established in these and other early interjections reappear as a central theme in Mendelssohn's Beor to the Pentateuch, where they are explored in the concrete terms of the orality of biblical law and Hebrew lyrical poetry. The orality of the Torah is thematized already in the extensive introduction to the commentary on the Pentateuch, Ola Netiva, like for the path, which was published in 1783, in a discussion about the function of the cantillations, the tammy, echoing the concepts of the relationship between music and words, Mendelssohn underscores the function of the cantillations not only as signs of syntactic articulation, but primarily as marks of oral expression of meaning. That is, the cantillations are the unwritten vocal expression of the affect of a biblical text by way of melody or chant, called vinigun a separate one for each emotional and rhetorical category, question, love, hatred, anger, joy, sadness, and so on. Without the cantillations, Mendelssohn maintains, the words are, and I quote, but dry bones, void of living spirit, the words of the speaker, almost incomprehensible, and if, then unappealing to the palate like bland, unsalted food, and will not penetrate the listener's heart. The role of the cantillations is critical. They are essential for a correct exegesis of the biblical text. Mendelssohn had encountered this idea in Judah Levi's 12th century book of the Kuzali. But departing and further interpreting Halevi, Mendelssohn asserts in a paraphrase on Maimonides' introduction to Mishneh Torah that although the biblical text was given by Moses in a written form to the people of Israel without cantillations, Moses himself heard the entire Torah recited by God with the proper vocalization, intonation, and cantillations, and declaimed it in his turn to Joshua, who recited it to the elders of Israel from whom the tradition continues. This procedure constitutes a perpetual practice of reenactment, as he further describes there in Saint, uh, in, in um, Olenatika. The child learning from his father or the pupil listening to his teacher would hear these enunciations with whatever was appropriate for their proper pronunciation, just as he had also received it from his father or teacher. And he continues, they would not give their children the written text only because this would be to them as a sealed book, but they read it to them out loud and chanting. And I read further, so that the words might enter their hearts and remain there as firmly implanted goats and males. Note how this description resonates with the much earlier fragments um, from an, an unfinished essay called Letters on Art, uh, where Mendelssohn has stipulated, probably 20 years earlier, on the power of words wedded with music. The purpose of this in, inestimable art, music, is to make the effect of poetry on our mind more emphatic, more vital, and more passionate. When a song in praise of God, of wisdom, or of virtue <coughs> is sung with the appropriate energy inspired by an accompanying instrument, it completely governs our sentiments. Here, too, music is given the role of explicating the innermost emotions of words um, that the words are intended to arouse. 
And the passage continues in a very interesting way, in an almost ecstatic crescendo. The rational perception of the sung words masters our soul, and the pleasantness of the tones through which the words are carried puts our senses into the state of the affect that they are supposed to arouse. The excitement becomes total. We are, stim we are sim simultaneously pulled away against our will, accompanied by joy and delight on our way to heaven. Mm. In, this, in the same vein, by attributing the cantillations to the text that was revealed to Moses on Sinai, Mendelssohn constricts a defense of the authenticity and unambiguity of the Torah. It is the orality of a biblical text, its inherent intonation, prosody, and even mimicry and gestures that reduce ambiguity. This argument, by the way, reappears also in Jerusalem in his political theological essay, uh, 1783, which the effect which might shed light on the perhaps political deliberations behind the engagement with musical language in the Vigur also. This is perhaps a little going a little more. In contrast, Mendelssohn contends texts transmitted in written form, only written form, are subject to copying or printing mistakes and deliberate editorial changes also. Yet the oral, indeed the musical transmission of the Torah, is not only innate to the revealed text, lending it its meaning and safeguarding its authenticity, it also constitutes a reenactment of divine revelation itself, one generation after the other. The defense of the singularity of the Hebrew Bible reaches its pinnacle in Mendelssohn's explication of biblical poetry. What was only touched upon in the 1757 review of Robert Loaf is fully elaborated in explicitly musical terms in the Be'ur in Mendelssohn's extensive introduction to Exodus 15, Song of the Sea. <coughs> Reiterating his contention regarding the unmetered verse of Hebrew poetry, which once again brings you that thing to mind, invokes the aesthetics of the sublime by which he had explicated the rules of art that distinguish biblical poetry from its work Roman counterpart and from contemporary European poetry. In the introduction to the Song of the Sea, however, we learn that it is precisely the unmetered verse of Hebrew poetry that constitutes one of the sources of its singularity and sublimity. It moreover lends itself most adequately to music for, I quote, there is neither advantage nor excellence in the measuring of syllables and rhymed verse, except with respect to the pleasantness of the sound to the ear. More important than mere sensuous debate is the intended meaning and content, which is the purpose of the utterance. Here, Madison addresses the core question of the translatability of poetry. Translating metered verse is likened to pouring good oil from one vessel into another, such that its fragrance is completely lost. For syllabic meter is intimately connected to a particular language. The nature of Hebrew poetry, being non-syllabic and unmetered, is thus its safeguard if this nature is maintained in the translation. While meter affords only meager excellence, as he calls it, a more quote, noble excellence arises from arranging content and statements in a beautiful way intended for the end desire in poetry, namely that the words enter not only the listener's ear, but also his heart, firmly establishing within him the virtues and excellent dispositions like stakes that will not be dislodged. It is in this manner, Mendelssohn asserts, that, quote, our ancestors chose to order their noble phrases in a manner that agrees with the art of music. In turn, the non-referentiality of music itself requires no translation and hence offers a universal aesthetic experience. The conclusion of this elaborate introduction sheds light on Mendelssohn's entire translation project, the, what he calls wondrous science of musical poetry possessed by the ancient Hebrews, has been entirely lost during exile. But, quote, the sweetness of the content, which is connected to the meaning and intention of the statement, rather than to the sound of the voice, nonetheless remains in our sacred poetry that is sensed by every wise reader. Its translation into another language can therefore maintain a certain sense of that sweetness. And so Mendelssohn concludes, 
that poetic magnificence is not entirely destroyed as occurs in the translation of Florence poetry, which is which relies on, on sensuous or what he calls sensuous delight. By the same token, also the music of ancient Hebrews is distinct from European contemporary music, as he admonishes the reader, do not imagine that the art of music However, do not imagine that the art of music that we know today was anything like the illustrious wisdom used by those complete artists, the ancient Hebrew poets. The primacy of meaning and idea, inherent to the completeness of the intellect, has to do with perfection for common height, was abandoned in favor of the sound, which is nothing but sensuous delight and pleasure to hear. Reading these lines, we begin to wonder what Mendelssohn had meant back in 1755 when writing about the divine art of music in his aesthetics. Um, perhaps he had imagined a prototype ideal of music, that what he calls wondrous signs inherent in the poetry of the ancient Hebrews, the music of Revelation. It is then Mendelssohn tells us the duality of words and music that constitutes biblical poetry, safeguarding its true meaning and ensuring its universality without blurring its singularity. I will use the remaining couple of minutes that I have for a few remarks in conclusion. By embracing the category of the sublime, Mendelssohn attempted to position the Hebrew Bible within Enlightenment discourse and secure for it an equal place not only next to classical Greco-Roman poetry, but also compared to models of modern European poetry. At the same time, he underscores the authenticity and singularity of Hebrew scripture as the cultural heritage of Judaism, ancient and modern. By turning the inferiority, as it were, of Hebrew poetry, as seen through non-Jewish European eyes, into an advantage and source of defiance, through a synthesis of Jewish exegetic traditions and modern European aesthetics, which articulates its embeddedness in music, Mendelssohn offered a defense of the singularity of the Hebrew Bible while buttressing his approach to translation, one that is concerned with meaning, interpretation, and sensation as an alternative to Christian Bible scholarship. In Mendelssohn's cultural theological project, the right translation is that which does not seek to blur boundaries of difference, but acknowledges an inherent measure of untranslatability in the translation itself, a translation that enables the music of Hebrew poetry to continue resonating also in Greek, as it were. Firmly anchored in the traditional Jewish world of the Torah, both written and unwritten, in which vocalization functions as a mode of experiencing and aspiring to the divine, as we heard here in the last session in many different beautiful ways, Mendelssohn not only found the conceptual language to lay bare the treasure of Judaism to the non-Jewish European world in which music and poetry were key cultural currencies. Indeed, more than mere apologia, he managed <coughs> to translate his experience as a Talmud scholar into a form of participation in and ultimately into a critique of enlightenment. Thus, while the Bi'ur represents the tr a traditionalist approach, his reliance on past exegetes and to simultaneous draw on modern aesthetics as part and parcel of Jewish hermeneutical tradition was precisely that which constitutes the novelty of the Bi'ur and of his critical and philosophical project at large, a performative manifestation of Judaism's continuous place within European civilization, affirming Jerusalem's distinct place also in, or rather next to, Athens. Thank you. Thank you, Yael. Yeah.